welcome to the Judgment Call podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet, risk takers, travelers, adventurers, investors, entrepreneurs, or simply mind boggers. To find all the episodes of this show, please go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or go to judgmentcallpodcast.com. For more resources, including how to become a guest, how to advertise, and to see all the lectures, podcasts, and books I would like to would like you to listen to or read, please also go to our website at judgmentcallpodcast.com. Like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or like us and subscribe to us on YouTube. That will make it easier for other users like you to find us later on. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is also my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the best travel deals for you as they happen. We do that in economy, premium economy, business and first class, and we screen 450,000 new airfare deals every day just for you and present the best based on your preferences. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% on the airfare deals. In case you didn't know, Americans and Europeans can already travel to more than 80 different countries again, South America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium for free, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP. If that's too much for you to type, just type in mtp4u.com, mtp4u.com to start your 30 day free trial. Hello everyone. Um, today I'm here with Bennett and Bennett has been the chief marketing officer uh, with a ton of different companies, uh, a lot of really big name companies like Huawei. And he's been holding management positions in uh, different countries, even uh, places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia. And uh, Bennett has described himself as an entrepreneur and someone who is a became who's becoming an expert and became an expert at managing innovation from inside the company um, using management techniques. And I'm really curious um, about his views on entrepreneurship, innovation, and it's really great to have you here today, Bennett. How are you? I am great. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Hey, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate that. I know you have a ton of knowledge to share and I'm really curious about that. What I what I wanted to start with is I, I just introduced um, um, a couple of things about you, and I know you you held these positions in a almost two or three year rhythm from what I could gather, and uh, you went to within these roles, so you lived and you worked in a lot of different countries. But give us an idea what are your favorites, um, not just in terms of what you did there um, as a as a job position. But what are your favorite countries? What are your memories you really think back to and you feel like, well, this is really something that was work, but actually it felt like an inspiration to my life? It, it, that is a really good question. Um, Afghanistan really comes, you know, that really pops out because it was right after the, the Taliban, uh, literally a month and a half. I went in to run the... Uh, as CEO of the, the national mobile operator, Afghan Wireless. So, and a group of American Afghan expats owned the business. They could not operate whilst the Taliban was there. So they hired a group of English, mostly English expats to run the network and the business. And that group uh, gave 20% of the business to the Taliban. Well, and if wow. you or I were, you know, literally in the the in country during that time, um, yeah, I could see that would be a nice way to ingratiate yourself. So one of the the to dos the board gave me going in was get that twenty percent back because Karzai doesn't own it. You know, they don't own any part of the business, which then Karzai assumed he owned it. Um, so that was one of the more interesting ones, but it was the. You know, being in country the very first night, um, landing, 
having 100 people and TV cameras to greet me on the tarmac, nothing to do with security. Oh, no, Mr. Bear, we don't need to go through security. Um, you know, waking up the very first morning. Oh, I should say my first night in country, there was a party. And there was a group of Afghan men that came to meet me. And th there was, you know, scotch in a paper bag at the end of the sofa, very discreetly. Yes, yes, we are in Afghanistan. Yes, we are a Muslim country. Alcohol is a bad thing. Pass me that paper bag, would you please? Um, but a fellow got up and he started talking. And I, I don't speak enough Farsi or Dari to understand, but um, at the end of it, I know a blood oath when I hear one. And later it was explained to me that this was the brother of a, a fellow named Masood, who was a famous freedom fighter. And he explained that he would give his eyes for his new friend, Bennett. And Bennett would obviously do the same for him. And he had, he was the, had the scariest eyes of any person I've ever met. And you know, that, yeah. was, that was night one. And then to wake up at four in the morning, as the sun come over the Hindu Kush, and there was, a, I, unbeknownst to me, there was a mosque just behind the guest house we were sleeping in. And the, call, the first call to prayer, which is when the, the Ayman can see the difference between a, red, a black thread and a white thread. That's kind of a, a, quite the wake-up call. Yeah, it is early. It is early. Um, yeah, I mean, it just it's, it's, it, it was never-ending things like that you, that you never encounter any place else in your career that really, you know, put everything in perspective. Yeah, I feel like you, you, you got really lucky there. You had an opportunity paid by your employer, hopefully, um, to experience different cultures and not just, I think this is, this is a problem I definitely face and a lot of people I, I, I've been talking to. You, um, I'm on this quest to go, not just to every country in the world, but really get a sense of most regions in the world. So if you think about Russia, there's Moscow, then there's St. Petersburg, very different cultures, and then there's Siberia, and then there's the south of the country. So this is still my quest. And the problem I'm facing is often you are there and you're, you're like, how do you, the, the way you can, can learn about people is not, I can obviously observe them, but there isn't um, a relevant discussion I can have with most people. You know, I can go to a restaurant, I can go to a coffee shop, but most people I have the opportunity to talk to, and I, I use LinkedIn for this. I actually reach out to people that are in my network and say, do you, do you want to have coffee with me or lunch? But I always felt that the problem with that approach is it's a very light, superficial conversation. And I think the, the, the great um, gift that you had over the, the years, and I call it that way, and it's probably it's been much tougher sailing, is to, to look into these cultures deeper because you have a daily um, encounter and there is money at stake. So usually when money is at stake, people um, put more investment into their communication and the way they show, um, they show certain, certain values that come out in their daily work. Um, that I think I'm, I'm really jealous of. Um, it's it's something that, that I always felt like is missing from from a lot of tourism that we think about today. People don't have this relationship, and you might say they don't want to. But there's a lot of digital nomads out there um, who would love to have this deeper relationship. But simply, it's very difficult to get there because you're in your own world, you're in your own company, and you can't really interact with people for better or worse. Right? That makes a lot of it's probably very stressful. Um, how, in, in retrospective, um, how much do you think you benefited personally from, from these interactions, relatively deep interactions with people over the years? It, 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 all right. It, this helps me kind of set the stage for my, my background and upbringing and, and why I think marketing is the best job there is. At, at the end of the day, I am an emerging technology product marketing guy. I come up with the idea or I see something, I, I figure out how to make a business up of it, convince others to fund it, support it, sell it, go build it. And then typically when it's successful, they pat you on the back and they say, oh, great. You know, thank you. Good job, Bennett. Uh, now we're going to let Torsten go run this and you go do something else. Um, yeah. and, and so the big influencer for me um, First off, my first job was, and it was not two or three years, it was like 10 years working at Casio. 
And the Japanese teach you basically two things in marketing. Go and see. Don't sit there and read a report. Go talk to people. Ask why five times. Still works. The other one, which re really reinforced that, one of my great mentors was a guy named Bill Heron, who's also my father-in-law. And he ran new business at Kimberly Clark. Now, he is one of the greatest entrepreneurs I've, and, mar and consumer product marketers I've ever met. Um, and he had the ability, I'll give you an example. When my wife was at university and she was, uh, one of her assignments, she was a nursing student. She worked late at night in a nursing home with seniors. She came home and her dad was up there late at night, which was unusual. So tell me about your day, honey. And she proceeded to explain to him how sad it was that these seniors were soiling themselves in continents. Light bulb, the pens, basically diapers for senior citizens. That's where that entire, that product and that entire category comes from. He had that gift. Another example, he was at my home um, years later uh, for a 4th of July gathering, and my boss at the time had a six-year-old son. Mommy, mommy, change me. Well, he thought that was a bit strange, so he followed the mother and child to my bathroom, how embarrassed the kid was. He wasn't you know, potty trained at six. Um, Pull ups. I'm a big boy now. That's where that comes from. So you know that kind. That was one of my influences, and he taught basically go and talk to everybody in the place. That is the job of marketing. You got to figure out what to do, what to make, why. You have to build bridges between everybody else in the organization to make things work, and that's basically product marketing. And a lot of people would a lot of people would say this is the job of an entrepreneur, right? It is yes. coming up with a, with an idea of the future, um, um, a caricature, so to speak, um, putting that into it used to be PowerPoint. Now it's probably a YouTube video, um, and put, describing that future, and then finding stakeholders, investors, um, people who who join for whatever reason feel this is how the future actually could look like. And then build a company around it, fundraising, actually executing on technology. Um, and, and that's why I, since, that's why I call yeah. myself an entrepreneur. Most of my no, career I, has been spent doing that within Unisys or British Telecom or, or Huawei, you know, within large organizations. And it, it's understood. Did you did you ever had the urge to become an entrepreneur yourself? What, yeah, what I, you I have stick to yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I've done my own startup. It, it's, um, eh, it's, it's nice. It, it's nice to work with other people's money. It's nice to work with resources because once you convince, you know, for example, I was at Unisys and we, um, there's seven different vertical lines of business. And I came up with the idea of, oh, I did most of the world's first mobile app store. And it's a great concept. You know, in 2000, uh, ahead of its time, but you could see mobility coming on like a freight train. But the difference was you had to convince the, the president of the transportation division that, hey, I can put a I can put an RFID stamp on every piece of luggage. And now every airline in the world can track their baggage. Would you think that's cool? Could you sell that? Yeah. Will you do that? No. Why? Well, I won't get the revenue credit. Huh. All right. Tell you what. How about you get all the revenue credit? Will you do it? No. Why? Well, it'll cost me. Okay. How about I do all the cost? You get all the revenue credit. But at the end of the day, we'll, we'll keep a set of shadow books because we both work for the Unisys mothership and we'll, we'll need to show each how much I help you contribute to the mothership. And we do that. Okay. That's, that's the difference between an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. But once you yeah. convince that, now I've got 100,000 guys selling into every airline on the planet 
Well, I can I can turn and burn and make revenue. You know, that's, you know, like I said, I've done this a couple thousand times, um, and and sifted through probably a hundred thousand different you know concepts and ideas to get the ones that we actually execute. So how if, if your role as an entrepreneur? How did you decide you you want to put your weight behind a certain idea? Is that something that 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 came down the chain? Is that something that that you realized yourself, or is it coworkers, and then it became a movement? And what? How did you decide what is a business idea you want to push against the mainstream? I assume in most companies, and uh, at what point do you feel there is something to it? Um, it kind of depends what you're talking about. It, it, in many of the instances, I was hired to come up with that idea, <clears throat> Unisys. Okay. Um, in other places, I was hired to execute and do that. Um, like, for example, I, Casio originally hired me to launch the LT70P video phone, which was a god awful product. It was, it, you know, was in, in the early 90s video conferencing, it was a new picture every two and a half seconds. So it was a slideshow. It's kind and of like I, Google Meet these days. Yeah, not yeah. Sure. And so I, I pulled the global launch my first week on the job because I knew it was an absolute dog of a product. How And grandma and grandpa were not going to buy it. And they had built 60,000 units for the initial test. However, what I did is I relaunched it with new distribution. It was very good for show and tell. So engineers, product guys, marketers, anybody who wants to see something, distance learning. Um, so I opened up new distribution, a dealer network to go sell it, doubled the price so there was enough fat on the bone that everybody could make money doing it. And suddenly we sold 6,000 units in the first, I think, in the first half year. My original um, uh, estimate, they said, what's your forecast? I said 3,000. And they had a board member with my shadow, and he quietly whispered, Bennett's on, how do you sell 3,000? I said, well, there are 3,000 stupid rich people in North America. And we, and we ended up selling 6,000, and we ended up selling another 13,000 a second. And by then, I was like a god within Casio. Now it was, they gave me my own R&D team and feed them ideas. So it was KSUless or wireless KSUless, you know, variations and all the other stuff they made. Um, so, and then that's kind of the way it went everywhere I've been. Does that answer yeah. your question? It does. It does. Um, you, you, your that was already predefined, so it isn't something you you had to like uh, harvest and find in in the wild there. Yeah, which makes it, things it, a little little easier, it seems. Yeah, it, it, the most interesting and the biggest transformation for me was when I got to Unisys, and you know Unisys. I, I took over the, the communications division, which was pretty much they did all mobile messaging, but the cap was this aging A series mainframe. And they knew they were, even Unisys knew they were going to lose everything within two years. So, okay, Bennett, uh, you, you need to life cycle away that 380 million in revenue. You got to replace it. We don't know what to do. We'll give you two people, and you don't have a budget. So what are you going to do? So it sounds, like, sounds like Y Combinator. Well, yeah. So, at, so I could see mobility coming on. Like for, this is in 2000. You could see, you know, it was WAP technology, but you could see mobility was really going to come on. And so, and, and and SMS, and I built an SMSC, and so we, you know, hit hit that tsunami of short message service, um, and and wrote it very from the beginning, started. But the, the and, and creating Moso. And so what I did then is, with success, you can build. And very quickly, I was able to bring in people, and all from my previous British Telecom Infinite relationships, I brought in a whole bunch of guys who were a lot smarter than me, but I've got the job. And let's say I hire you and put you in charge of mobile payments and put another guy in charge of lifestyle, you know, mobile games and apps and what have you. Uh, another one in charge of infrastructure, another one in charge of enterprise. And so now I've got four products, which is how I made my money. 
And I let them, I mean, I'm the referee. I control the factory. I had 3,000 engineers by that time. So what are we going to make? What are we going to do? What are we going to productize? And so my these four groups each had their own technology officer or technologist. And they would do a basic business plan. And every week we'd sit down and say, all right, here's our to-do list. This is what we're building. What do you want to do, Torsten? What do you want to make? Why? And everybody all gets right. a vote on it. And it became competitive within the team. But no, you know, and granted, I, I always shifted things. But my job became more get you what you need to be successful. Again, these were all really smart people and, and they all have gone on to be vice presidents, presidents you know, of research in motion or Sony uh, mobile or other, you know, they're, they're all really in O2. These guys are, you know, all work for me. And so my job, get them, get them cooperation, get them funding, get them, you know, sales, get them relationships. You know, what do they need to be successful? I can, again, I can I, totally I, see that. Yeah, I, I fully understand, and I, I see that CEO mindset in you. I think that's that's something that isn't isn't explored enough. I think most people don't know enough about it. How difficult it can be, kind of like a VC to to oversee what's going on, but not be on an operational day to day level, or only be partially on a day to day level. And one theme that you did you also mentioned in a, in a prior podcast, I found really interesting is this. And I think this is the role of marketing, and I want to want to really see your your view on this. Is uh, how do you manage not just all these people, but how do you how do you manage the the specific problem of technology and the human connection? Humans buy stuff, and technology is that what has scaled up and creates value many times. But but how do you feel you can you can put these things together? Where do you get your inspiration between the human connection and the technology on the other side? I think it's it's a gut reaction. Um, you know, do you see something? Does it make sense? Would I use this? The other, then you have to answer the big question, who wants it? Why? Who wants to sell it? Why? If you can't answer those two questions, you're in big trouble. And you could have the best mousetrap in the world, but if nobody's going to sell it, you're going to fail. And so, and then after you go, you know, part of my, you know, you go through decision gates to get anything done. And in large organizations, there's a lot more steps to getting the, you know, how do you want to get it approved, what we're going to build. And this is also the, for, a, for the marketing guy, this is the most important step in how you deal with the entrepreneurial owner because that is the most difficult person to manage upward because most of these guys are flakes. You know, they, they can be very gifted, but Elton Musk is an absolute flake. And, you know, or Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, I've been in the room with the guy, um, but he's very entrepreneurial in spirit and he will sit on the plane next to somebody and said, oh, oh, I saw this great thing, we need to go do this. And you're, if you're running a marketing group and, and a product group, you've got to manage that process. And so the only way to do that is this is my to-do list. We only have so much bandwidth and money to do something. And say, oh, okay, Mr. CEO, that's a, man, that is a great idea. Ah, that is the best thing I've heard. I agree. Which one of my 10 things do we want to kill? No, 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 no. This is the best thing I've ever heard. So which one of the ones do you want to kill most? That's you. You need to take the personality out of managing that process, and and so your to do list becomes this is this is the the defense for everybody. It also is when you when you get into large companies like Huawei, where you've got a couple hundred thousand people and everybody's got ideas. What are we going to make and do and execute on? You need to develop through every department so that every person has a, has a say and can come up with an idea and how do we track it? But at some point we're gonna say yes, no. And you wanna make that to be grouped and peering decisions, ideally. And then it keeps funneling down to what you actually wanna execute on. But 
to be quite frank, whenever I get something and I, it would be questionable, like I had mobile phones, I would, I would show it to my mother-in-law. Could she use it? If, if yes, it probably would work. If not, if, they, if she couldn't see it made any sense, uh-uh, it's probably gonna die. And, and everybody has, you know, your trusted advisors. Those are the, you know, it's that gut check, I think, that really people don't take the step to use to say whether or not something is going to be work and accepted. Yeah, I think the grandma test is very popular. A lot of people have been employing that. And uh, the, 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 the problem, I mean, I, I feel like... Um, I, 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 um, my grandma liked one of my startups and uh, that didn't go anywhere. And then the next one she didn't understand and that took off. Um, so it, it, didn't, it didn't really help me from a small sample size, but I'm fully with you. It's a great way to, to explore how the rest of the world would look at it. There is, and you said that earlier, there is a bunch of companies that literally never did any marketing in a, or sales to speak of. Marketing maybe is the wrong word, but they never did any sales to speak of in the technology Silicon Valley sphere, and they've, they've been doing very well. My example would be Google in the early days, not anymore. Um, I would say Instagram in the early days, obviously now very different animal, WhatsApp, Signal. There's all these companies that seem to come out of nowhere. They're properly funded. They buy, I'd say, influencers, and uh, they do have a certain way to uh, to create that network effect. Or LinkedIn would be, be one of those. Is that something you feel, how can you predict the success of those? Because there's so many of them out there and you never know because they don't have sales. You can't look at any numbers. There's no intermediate metrics, it seems. They go from zero to a thousand in a matter of months. And they, they don't want to make any money, right? They want to give it away for free and then they want to be bought by someone else and monetize it in a very different, unique way. But do you do you have a way to predict those? And how do you look at those? Do you think they're all crazy people? Um, or how, how do or what's your view on, on that piece? Yeah, of for every one of those, you've got probably a thousand that are not a very good idea. And, and, it's, and it's actually probably, if you've spent any time like working with, uh, in, a, in a Kickstarter organization, which I did in China, as I said, I've gone through easily a hundred thousand concepts and ideas and should, you know, and gone through, started the vetting process and, and probably um, five times that in just outrageous ideas that we didn't even bother to give the time of day to. Um, lightning does strike and you can't see everything, but I think there's a, what, you know, again, who wants it? Why? And who wants to sell it? Why? Now, Google was one I missed. And my wife said, oh, we should buy shares. <laughs> I said, this is silly. No. Called that one completely wrong. Um, but then again, I took futures on Palladium, which many people didn't. And, you know, it became a, a standard for uh, mobile handsets and, and computers. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of like for me, for personal investing, the first time I went into a Walmart, you can look around and say, man, this is a really good concept. There is something here. And so I go, when I do that, I buy 200 shares. That's my own personal investment strategy, one of them. Um, and I think most online or mobile apps, you know, it, it, it's there's the silly and there's the practical you know a navigation app very practical yep people will do that you know and i'm surprised there's no digital assistance really for a mobile device and that's a huge opportunity um another one is one of the my mobile apps that i invented death clock torsten if you go to an insurance guy how old are you married smoke drink Children, he'll tell you the basically when you're going to die. All right, let's load it up into a database, and now you can literally pull that. I think it's still running someplace in the world. You can see, you can sign up, and in the it'll give you your life clock when you're going to count down. <laughs> Death clock. I better not look at this. I better not it's, look at this. Well, yeah, and it's pretty. It, it was one of the most stupid things, you know. But hey, I invented it. Whoop de doo. Yeah. Um, and I can't think that I, there was never any money in it, but it was a 
you know, had somebody come to me with that idea, I would say, well, okay, that's nice, but I don't think the life on that's very long. And a lot of yeah, these things, yeah, 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 and you remember right at Casio, when we had um, questionable products, we would get every employee a hundred bucks and tell them to, uh, that weekend to go out and buy it. And they'd buy it and bring it in and we'd put it back in the, in the box in the warehouse and we'd ship it out again. But that would, you get the pull through through big box retail who said, oh my gosh, you know, this answering machine is a huge success. We need more. So you see the market. And I think, you know, the digital marketing on a lot of these online applications or services is self-fed. As, you know, influencers. It's it's not necessarily real. It's not necessarily sustainable. And I think a lot of that comes from, you know, common horse sense and, and gut feel more than anything. Yeah. I'm with you. I mean, I'm, I find that, I think everybody finds this vetting um, because you have no intermediate metrics. These things go from nowhere to huge in a matter of, of days and literally there's, there's nothing in, in between. The, the, there's one theme out there, and I'm curious how you think about that, is the world, how it's going to be like the next 50 years, so to speak. We, we all are going to have the opportunity to spend a bit of our time as an entrepreneur. Um, we probably have other jobs going on, but we have a certain part of our life where we invent something that's completely unique. That could be a, a bit of code on GitHub. That could be um, something on Kickstarter could be, it doesn't have to be any of those platforms There's one creative, um, but scalable in that sense, uh, creation. And what's so fascinating about that. And the question is, if that's true, we kind of build these virtual companies, so to speak, it goes off of one inspiration of a person and this piece of code, this piece of an app, or, oh, that's just, it will look, probably look different, but it makes everyone in this world more productive and they can use it for a small fee or it's actually free. And then they donate to it. Um, this is a, a wonderful picture to be drawn and it, it kind of goes um it, it works very well on these platforms and i agree with you this is very self-serving youtube obviously wants a lot of people who make videos for free so they can monetize them right but do you think this is a vision for the future or we will go back to something that actually makes sense that you that you own that you build an enterprise around it where where it's sales is and a team that owns a unique ip is going to make the difference in the future I think the technology is going to shift dramatically in about 10 years. And we're going to be moving toward nanites. And nanite tech is another paradigm shift. I mean, it, it, it's small, for those that don't understand, it's small distributed processors the size of a grain of sand. And they'll be, you know, be mixed in the paint. The wall will be the computer, the screen, the device. Um, everything. It'll be woven into the fabric of your clothing. So if you've seen Tom Cruise and Minority Report, he walks into the Gap and it says, hi, Torsten, last time you were here, you bought some slacks. Would you like to see some shirts? And you, you know, you look at yourself in different shirts. Um, that kind of technology is going to be with us in 10, 12 years. The, the foundations are here already. Um, I think there'll be one aspect that you, you mentioned the YouTube, I think it'll be the experiences because avatars and the virtual reality will be part of that enhanced experience. And let's say, you know, I've always wanted to be a surfer. I've always wanted to know what it's like to get on a surfboard and, you know, go through a, the, a tube on a wave. Well, you're going to have some world-class server who's, um, Serper, who's going to be able to make that experience, and you're going to be able to virtually live that. So I think travel, as you mentioned, both you and I like travel. We like learning things. We like you know finding the culture. I think those experiences are going to become the new YouTube um, in the not too distant future, and I think and it'll be service based. Um, but the people who build those platforms will still exist and the way information is used will still be exist. And I think that's another paradigm shift that's waiting to come is the way and, and privacy and marketing. And you already see a huge split in the way um, ocratic governments such as China handle personalization and privacy. 
the way the EU is, is very different than the United States. So I think you're going to see some changes in that and it's, and it will be painful. And that will also dictate a lot of how things will go in the future. You know, it's one thing to have the technology. It's another to see it enacted and, and um, executed on. A lot of the technology gets bought up and, and thrown in the, the closet because it inter- impacts somebody's revenue stream. And, you know, Google, Google, Apple, they, you know, Cisco, they buy a lot of technology and they throw it away because they don't want to disrupt their own, you know, it's disruptive to their revenue streams. Um, and you see, my, my favorite shopping, my favorite uh, search engine is like.com. It was a visual search engine. You're looking for brown shoes. You're looking for brown shoes with low heels, brown shoes, low heels, laces, brown shoes, laces with tooling on. You know, you can get as as down as specific as you want. Fantastic technology. Google bought it 10 years ago. Haven't seen the lighter day of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you watched the, the TV show Silicon Valley, which I, I didn't watch for the longest time. And then I got into it a couple of months ago. And it's, you know, very well, well, well outlined this, this game of uh, buying comp- competitors or potential competitors just as a defensive move. And uh, just the sheer scale effects with m- most of the tech giants, they, they are so enormous, they can literally buy a whole country. To, um, you know, the sure. market cap of, of, of Apple buys you all of Eastern Europe and, and you still have money left. Um, and everything that's there in these countries, which is which is ginormous, and you know, we they probably keep on growing for quite some time. So they literally at one point can shop all of the U.S. or all of China, which is really strange to see that. So there's a there's a there's a huge incentive for these companies to protect their revenue streams at all costs, and I feel they will go to great lengths to do that. Not just by destroying companies around them, but I feel we've seen that they will take a lot of political influence in a way that they can make sure they still make as much money on the next three years as they did in the last three years. That's really scary. Do you, do you feel that it's something we can do about this, which is a lot of people call for regulation for section 230 to change. And it, it all seems to be very politically motivated. Do you feel there is something, and I, I'm in, the, in that camp where I say other technology will probably help that problem. Do you see there's a big revolution coming on and in, in kind of breaking up that power of big tech, or do you think they're just going to keep accumulating? No, it, it definitely will be. They'll, you're going to see a lot of antitrust. There definitely will be a, a backlash against that, one. Two, more than at any other time in um, the last thousand years, how somebody, how sustainable somebody is is very short. I don't think we're Google is not an IBM. It's you know Google will not exist in a hundred years. Facebook is not going to exist in fifty. I don't think Facebook's going to make ten years. But um, so because there somebody will come up with something new. And and for example, the next generation of mobile devices, which all haptic technology, Apple doesn't own any of the patents. So they're going to be literally either paying somebody else or they're going to be left out and they're going to go into a serious decline. And so you're going to, you know, again, we're in about 10, 12 years, um, you're going to see with nanites, you're going to see a whole range of other technologies that are absolute paradigm shifts. It's not going to be based on Intel or Microsoft. And so it'll be somebody else. And those, those guys will rot. One, I think, as a marketer, brands are learning that they have a voice. They have power. They need to wield that very carefully. But things like, hey, we need to wake up and term limits. Somebody shouldn't be sitting there in government for 50 years. That's kind of silly. Nobody should be there that long. So, you know, but that's not very popular. And certainly none of the current politicians, but at some point, hopefully the populations will wake up and say, you know, we need to do something about this. Why don't we make um, 
why don't we make government service part of uh, like Switzerland where you're required to serve in the military for a couple of years. Why don't we, at some point in your life, you need to serve the public in some way. You can be a teacher, you can be a fireman, you can be a senator. You know, you, you need to serve, you know, four years or eight years of, of service to the public. So, I mean, so there's a lot of ways, but I think we're politically, we're a ways away from doing something that, and the current politicians aren't going to want to support that because they'd have to go work for a living. You know, there's something odd going on, and I, I, it, it's really coming on in diff lots of different facades. And it's something that I that I I've been realizing going to China myself is that I think the last twenty years we have given up largely to to innovate in a physical world, and China is still in that world where they use technology to improve the physical world. I mean, most of the cities like Wuhan looks like like. Um, a city from 20 years into the future. There's uh, skyscrapers and there's cars going through the skyscrapers and there is tunnels, but they, they look more high tech than I, anything I've ever seen. Um, when I went to Wuhan last year um, before before the um, COVID hit. And I thought that's there is a real adventure and desire in China, strangely enough, because it's, we think of it as a state and enterprise, the whole country. But what they have done is it still create this physical and this can, you can discuss all the way to manufacturing, they're, they're building that skill. And I feel like the US has, and that's related to what you just said, the US has this desire to just move themselves into the cloud. Literally the most, this is like the COVID response, right? We, we are basically being told to stay at home, to watch Netflix, um, to read books, to, to transform our life um, and our whole identity into something that looks like we're courts while, right? We upload ourselves into some, some, some computer cloud consciousness and then that's how we should live. And that's primarily in the US a trend. So we, 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 we use cloud technology everywhere and we are leaders in this and there's tons of engineers and there's PhDs that do this, but the physical infrastructure barely sees any of that innovation, at least in the US. Do you think that's true, A, and B, do you think that's gonna keep continuing? To, to, most technology brands are basically cloud only and they ignore everything else. Um, I, I don't think the U.S. is the leading cloud country by a long shot. Well, cloud is uh, a, as a broad definition, not as cloud, cloud service, but like as a, as a way that we define our future. No. It, and again, it goes in cycles. Cloud, tell me the difference between cloud and mainframe computing. I know we talked difference. about that, but I, I want to, I want to, I, I think of cloud as more of a, a digital, digital experience, not just cloud, cloud, but as an experience where we feel like we kind of retreating from the physical world and go into the digital world. And I, well, whenever you look at something that took off is obviously digital, but that's not true in China. And I mean, they have, they've built train networks, they've built ginormous airports that are actually still having a ton of flights. So they haven't really cut back on domestic flights. So they have a ton of physical infrastructure that can come out of digital innovation planning and the way they build it. They build well, certain certain buildings sure. just with drones and they build them in a, in a day. And you're like, whoa, we can't even build things in five years. Like in San Francisco to build a road takes like 10 years now and costs a hundred billion dollars, which the same road is being done in, in China for five million and it looks way nicer. So that I feel is... Well, let, let's, let's, let's yeah, hold on. Let's, China has, it's a different culture, one. Now, I, I, at Huawei, I spent three years in Shenzhen, small city of 20 million. Shenzhen did not exist in 1990. It was a fishing village with less than 5,000 people, not 20 million. And they brought in several hundred thousand people you're not going to get paid. We'll feed you. You are going to build a city. We're not going to pay you. Your children will thank you. And they built it. And it, as you said, it is, it is as modern as you can get, copying a lot of American cities right down to there are no bicycle lanes. So, you know, some of that planning can go a little awry. Um, China Business School teaches you to copy somebody else, making it more efficiently than somebody else, 
gaining market share, gaining a commanding position in the market, and then innovate and do something unique. A lot to be said for the success of that strategy. So, you know, it, it, it's, you know, they're, they're doing very, very well. They also have a lot of problems in China, and that's going to come back to, to haunt them. But they, it's, it's a different culture. And what I enjoyed Huawei, you know, there was no male, female, um, there was no political, you know, I had a cube in the farm, like every, I'm the global chief marketing officer. What do you do? Um, I have a cube, a desk in the cube of the cube farm like everybody else. Everybody's equal, pretty much. What did exist was clicks of where you went to school. And there are, there are three premier engineering universities, and Huawei has three clicks within it. And that's why Mr. Ren rotates and have three different CEOs every 18 months so that no one click, because if you get, you're my boss and you get promoted, I go along with you. But that's why he rotates everything every 18 months to keep balance between those different clicks and no one click will have to, you know, it's, so it's a different culture way of do things. Can, can, can we make anything and make, you know, um, maglev trains? Yeah. Do we want to? No. And again, our, infra our, our infrastructure is such that we're getting as much out as we can, the, the wires in the ground, where they don't have that wire in the ground in China or in Africa. And so they've gone completely wireless. Yeah, okay. But again, you're gonna see paradigm shifts in technology and it'll, it'll be a leap, leapfrog and then we'll get leapfrog and that's the way it, that's, that's technology. That's the way it goes. Yes. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm with you that the, uh, but uh, that would be my ne next question. Um, I'm with you with this. Um, when, when we talk about, you talked about nanites earlier, are you familiar with Ray Kurzweil's view and what, what do you think of it? Do you think it's going to happen at that time frame, 2045? Now it has been revised. I was told a couple of episodes ago to 2038, like a, a new time frame where we feel technology will as will change our lives so um, strongly that it's hard to predict what actually happens. That's why he calls it a singularity. Do you think that's in the cards in the next 15, 20 years, or it's much further out, or it's, it's not going to happen at all? I think it's further out. I think the, the human experience is slow to take up radical change. Um, and it'll take, you know, anytime you, you introduce it, You've got at least 20 years. You've got a, a generation to change it out. And, you know, my generation, computers did not exist. You know, I, I still know how to use a slide rule. Um, calculators were brand new when I was, you know, going to university. Um, and, and now kids have computers. It, it you know, it, it just, it runs in cycles. And you learn, need to learn to, to navigate those and deal with them that human experience and you hope I guess part of me is hopeful that future generations will be a bit smarter and learn from mistakes and be more careful about how you implement new technology yeah people people are especially concerned in that realm about AGI and quantum computers and uh, you know that's that's what what we hear this from China the, the problem is once you have one of those things, and there's probably going to be more of those, but that we're going to find out, it seems like you're going to be, you have it one day and just a year later, you're like almost in a different plane of existence on this planet. It changes everything, right? A quantum computer um, can potentially decrypt any encryption that's out there in a heartbeat. Um, it it can compute things in, in, in so parallel that yeah. Okay. You can, you can, so yeah. So, you're the so only, potentially, right. Right? you're so, the only so computer I'm, that matters in the world anymore, right? And that's so, so once this no. happens, we have so, the singularity. But maybe so that's you go back to so you go back to something like programming in COBOL or Fortran, which is right. impossible okay. and has never been broken. It's not possible. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So so there there are solutions for every problem. And I think they're yeah, but it's so, not a problem, so to speak. 
uh, well, sort of it's it's this is just a side effect of something that's so massively parallel that you you don't need any other computer anymore because this one thing can do it in in a, in a the same time, right? That, that's it's a fear, right? I'm not saying it's realistic. Yeah, yeah, no, it, 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 it science is. fiction. One one of the better books I've read is uh, G Guns, Germs, and Steel, which looks at human history, sixty thousand years of evolution. You know, literally from the caveman emigrating out, agriculture, germs, warfare, you know, and, and with examples from all over the world. You either adopt and integrate, which is the human condition, or you get, you expire. You become extinct. And, and that happens if you don't adopt to something. So if China came out and they invented quantum computers and we didn't, or they used artificial intelligence and we didn't, and that is the game changer, well then they are going to win and you know the rest of the world will adopt or get run over. And that's, that's part of the human condition. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I this is certainly the conservative case and the, there is this case of things will move so quickly but you know probably people have said that 100 years ago about the automobile um and we we, we figured out how to to live with this properly the same is true about the nuclear bomb right but it did change the 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 whole dynamic about the second world war in a positive way a lot of people would argue um and very very quickly uh, but at the time um you know the conventional um attacks and the nuclear bombs, they were almost at the same level. So it was predicted to be a big game changer and it kind of was, but it kind of also wasn't because you could have done the same thing with just conventional bombs at the same time. So I, I haven't really made up my mind. I'm, I'm personally a big believer in what Ray Kurzweil um, has been predicting and his track record is just so enormous. And maybe because I want to believe in it, right? It's almost like a, it's a bit of a religious faith in this, um, but it creates a lot of other issues. Um, um, the way we define humanity and what humans do when all the machines take over. And it's, it's purely speculative right now, right? These things right, but, could but turn you, out very, very differently. We've been reading for the last 80 years, you know, Isaac Asimov and science fiction writers have been doing, you know, been thinking about this and writing about it for quite a, quite a long time. And uh, I think that's one of the ways that we can, de you know, examples that we can deal with robots and artificial intelligence and um, a government that ha has all the answers and watches everything that we do. Yeah, I, it it's definitely sounds scary and people definitely buy into this. Um, what I have, just to get it on a, on a different track, I have a couple of quick questions for you. Um, and I would be grateful you can, if you can, um, answer them with just like a short sentence or a couple of sentences. Um, sure. Um, Okay, so where did I put my quick questions? In, the terms, in terms of technology companies, what's a technology company from your point of view that has a great product but really terrible marketing? Great product and well, Huawei obviously comes, comes to mind okay. right now. Um, it, it, and it's because of the, because of the the, the five G fears or, or why no, no, it's a when I was there the U S government um, and, and you have to appreciate I I've had quite a bit to do with the as they say, call it red black environments Department of Defense projects and um, and when I went to Huawei a, a friend in the Department of State said don't take the job. Well, they're offering me an awful lot of money and I need to feed my family, so I went. Um, and about halfway through my tenure, there started to be these rumblings that, oh, Huawei's a bad guy. And I'm, you know, I, I, and it's kind of funny, I had lunch, the, the, the next door to me was the Global Chief Technology Officer, Tony Johnson, who's a former U.S. Navy SEAL. Um, the CIO is a, is a, a 35 um, year IBM or former Canadian military, and we're like, where are the bad guys? I don't, 
I see people playing solitaire. Um, so I would have handled this, and my, my advice to Mr. Um, Wren was to handle things very differently um, and to make, it, make light of it, make humor, to confront things head on. They chose not to do that. And when I left, there was three Chinese people doing my job. And they let it fester too long. And that put them in a very disadvantageous situation. And if you look at 5G, it is, you know, beyond silly that basically Huawei went from the leading mobile infrastructure provider to basically being out of the market. It's, it's, yeah. in, it, it, that is politics and business and, and has nothing to do I, with I don't, security. Yeah, I don't understand the, the 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 whole discussion because obviously the network layer and the security layer they have nothing to do with each other. We could have Huawei backdoors into whatever encryption is there, but we can put our own encryption layer on top of this, and it would would be perfect, right? Everyone would be better off. So I I don't understand the, well, the, so, the but, real but discussion. But everything, every piece of Western kit has what's called the law enforcement access protocol leap. Yeah. It has a backdoor. I was approached by the same friend, the Department of State, and said the NSA would like to have Huawei put the leap into our kit. And oh, respectfully, okay. we can't do that because we sell to Busafasa and Iraq and Iran and you know Libya, um, and they don't want that. Um, you know, and, and Huawei is kind of funny. Huawei actually has an adversarial relationship with the Chinese government. And um, and I know this from having been a customer of Huawei, and you know, and ZTE. When I was in Bangladesh, I was the CEO of the mobile operator, and and you know, I was a customer of both ZTE and Huawei. And ZTE is the government. And if you bring a ZTE, you want a good price from Huawei, you make sure the ZTE rep is sitting in your lobby, because they will do anything to kill ZTE. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, and as, so after that uh, refusal, we started hearing some political grumblings and we started looking at, you know, oh, Huawei has a, is a security risk. And we're like, what the heck? You know, again, my CTO is, is a former Navy SEAL. And we started looking at our infrastructure, which is all Dell and IBM servers. And we found that the NSA had actually hacked Huawei in 2009. So they knew and saw everything that was going on. Um, and, and it's just, it's beyond, it's, it's pure, it's political theater. Yeah. And that is yeah, very I, get the same I get the same impression. I, I can't really follow that. Um, the next yeah, question. Another, the, the Japanese, the Japanese yeah, one would be another one. Hitachi, um, Toshiba, um, they've done a terrible job marketing. NEC, they do an atrocious job marketing. Um, but they've got some of the best kit and you know, if you want to do cloud service brokerage, or if you want to do um, any number of things, you know, the, some of the, the technology from those companies is the best in the world. Um, but their marketing is god awful. Yeah. Well, where would you see the opposite? And I, I think I can already guess that. But you have a really crappy product, but fantastic marketing in the technology space. Well, my best example is Mercedes-Benz. Oh, I, I thought you were going to say Tesla. Yeah, that, that'd, be, that'd be another example, yeah. But uh, okay. and, and, and if you ever talk to somebody about the you know, Tesla and the electrical problem, but Mercedes-Benz, you know, for a premier top dollar brand, fantastic, best marketing you can buy. You know, their, their brand is, is solid gold. But the car is, you know, if you look at the last 10 years of consumer brand, they're, they're middle of the road to the lower half of the top 50 automakers in the world. They make a crummy automobile. But, you know, they, they, the cachet and you're, you're in the club and, the, and they're able to maintain top dollar for an inferior product. Which is a, a, a poor example of marketing. I don't want to be a marketer of that kind of company where you're kind of a, as they call it, a storyteller, and uh, you're a, you're a slick used car salesman. 
you know, rather, I mean, you, you, we all have to do that on occasion, but if that's your stock and trade, I don't want to, do, I, that's not the way I want to be. Which is surprising because I feel, and maybe there's more to this history, but a lot of German companies, kind of like Chinese and Japanese companies, they excel um, at good manufacturing skills, and usually <laughs> even the CEOs yes. coming coming out of those 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 internal ranks, they rise up, become CEO. So they really have no insight into marketing. They actually have no clue why anyone is buying their product. They know there's demand out there, but they think it's because they have great technology. And Mercedes-Benz is interesting. You bring up that example. They must have taken a different road, especially in the U.S. I think. Um, and because I, I, their, their, their luxurious image, but also their technological prowess, it's something that's more, more strong in the U.S. I don't feel they're known in Europe for that, for being, um, well, maybe there is a little bit of this, but it's more like because they've been around so long, they're so established, but they don't have this strong advantage in marketing, so to speak, that they have here. So BMW is there and Audi, they're almost at the same level. Yeah, yeah. I, I... It, it does change on where the world you, you look at these things. Um, and that creates opportunity. Um, Campbell Soup is another great example. You know, again, engineering run company that doesn't put a value on marketing. And they've lost market share. They've, you know, they've done very poorly. They did very poorly through the pandemic. But they're, they're basically, you know, always have been run by engineers, not, not marketers. And it's, it's kind of the difference, I think, the difference between how you define marketing and product marketing. Um, I, I look at marketing as an iceberg. The 10% of the iceberg above the waterline, that's the fun, fluffy stuff, the PR and the Marcom and the you know, influencer and the social and all that wonderful stuff that everybody sees. But 90% of the work is under the water. How do we, what do we make? How do we make it? How do we make it efficiently? How do we make it profitably? How do we sell it? How do we, you know, how do we take care of it? Well, yeah, it's all that mundane work that the product marketer does. And product marketers have to do, you know, the PR side as well. So, but more and more, more and more, you see marketing being defined by the people who just do the fun, fluffy advertising stuff. And it's it's um, it gives it a bad name. I I think you are absolutely correct. The product development part of, of of innovation is something that isn't it doesn't get enough credit. And there's a marketing part to it, right? And there's a um, there's a technological part to it. And both sides need to come together. And you, you mentioned that earlier. That's that's really tricky for most people to pull off because they come from one side. They either come as sales guys, they come in as marketing guys, right. they come in as developers. And they hate each other. And if they can avoid that meeting, then they would try to. And I had I, I used to work in a company that had started. And what happened is we literally had these two, this hallway, but we had different wings. And one wing was sales, um, one wing was HR marketing, um, and then another one was, was included product development at the time. And uh, the other side was development, hardcore software development. And literally, if they would see each other in the hallway, they would they would just go back into this into their wing. They would literally not cross the hallway. And I felt it was so difficult to find someone who would even venture to the other side of the building. Most people just wouldn't do it. They would just they would do it once, and then they would get uh, so humiliated by that experience they would never do it again. And you could see this in any meeting. You could bring people together, and they would still hate each other. And like they would talk to each other, but they wouldn't really talk to each other. And this is something I have very rarely observed in telecom and large technology companies. I've never seen it. And, and, and I think in part because every, every CMO of large technology companies or telcos, mobile operators, have spent time in sales. Everybody on my teams, if, if you were you know, young, and you were you look like you're a promising marketer, I immediately send you to sales for six months to a year or two. Because you cannot you cannot market something. Marketing is how do you do profitable business? Repetitive. And so you need to sell better than the salespeople. 
can't you can't tell sales how to work smart if you can't sell. And you know, so the first litmus test is: Does sales help use marketing to close business? And every tech company I've ever been at, you know, I, I probably I, half of my job, you know, it seemed I was being used to help close business somewhere because my guys were the, you know, it, the other way is they treat marketers only as the PR advertising storyteller, and then they've got engineers who do the product development. Well, that that is a disaster because that's they need product marketing, which is that what do we make, why do we make it, and how do we make it profitably? You, it, you become a mini GM, and that's the way the most telcos and, and um, large tech companies operate. So, but smaller ones, you know, try to get, they bypass that, and so they split it up. And I think that becomes part of the, that it becomes a cultural problem with the company. Yeah, absolutely. That, that yeah, I have a related question for you there. So imagine you're in a new role. Um, you go into a company as a CEO or CMO, and you only have, we have one person that would be your first meeting. Would it be the head of sales, the head of the prior marketing, the head of engineering? Who would be the first person you want to have lunch with? Your biggest customer. Oh, okay. I, that, that person is on the list too. Who so wants let's, it? Let's, Why? Who sells it? Why? You know, it, it, you got to answer, you know, the first 90 days, I would say the first people I want to talk to are your top 10 customers. Then I want to talk to the, the, the head of every business unit, you know, the head of customer care, the head of sales, the head of marketing, the head of, you know, operations or engineering. Yeah, I want to meet with all of those and look at their interactions between them and the processes between them. That, that's that's number you know in either CMO or CEO or so COO roles. Um, that's the first thing I look at. What are those relationships like? What are the dynamics and the methodologies between them? And then you look at are they doing things like continuous improvement methodology, which I'm a huge believer in. It has to when when you're on top and you've got you know 99 market share. That's when you want to innovate, or kick off a new, you know, a new brand to start cannibalizing your business. You, you know, you you need to constantly, every quarter, sit down and say, "Hey, how can we do this better?" And that you need to make that part of your culture. Yeah, if you're not innovating, you're dying, um, just in a slow rate. Uh, one thing that always troubled me in my career is how do I find honest sales guys? So the sales guys come in, they have a great pitch. They obviously know how to personally sell. They have a lot of experience on paper. That's hard for you to validate because you can ask for references, but nobody will give you the actual sales numbers of the sales guy. And then uh, it's, it's, there's different compensation structures. But how do, you, how do you find good experience and honest sales guys? Well, I, I never figured out the process. What, what I basically ended up doing is trial and error, right? I had hired a bunch. And after like two or three months, I let half of them go because they didn't produce anything. But maybe they were just in for the long term and would make their deals. I had a hard time figuring out and predicting who would be a good sales guy. Um, two, two things. First, for me, it's a, it's a gut level reaction. Is this someone that I would never invite to my home? I'd hire that person. Oh, okay, that's a contrary view. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a very good salesperson. I don't like to sell, which is why I went into marketing. I didn't like, you know, I, I can carry a bag and I'll I'll get you the deal, um, but I don't want to have to do that every single day. And that's where marketing needs to come in and and say. And, and, and the, the object of sales management is what is, what are our numbers? We need to make how many calls to make so many appointments. And, you know, if I need to make 100 calls to get three appointments, and I know out of every three appointments, I'm likely to close one. Okay, those are my numbers. I can manage to that. You need to find out what that is. The other one is, you simply, you, you manage sales by numbers, by results, plain and simple. And if somebody's not pulling their weight, you get rid of them. And, you know, the, the, the best sales is a brutal profession. And I, you know, it literally, 
your, your replacement is outside the door. So, you know, you need to come in with some, some numbers this quarter. And, and I don't think it's very difficult to have a honest salesperson that enjoys being on the street, on the road, year after year. It's very difficult to maintain that. So, and, and if they do, this is a problem with a lot of like in, in the channel business, in technology, the value added reseller. I've met, you know, dozens um, of salespeople that literally make a million dollars a year selling tape backup storage to the government. Well, why do I want to sell your mobility crap, Bennett? I'm making a million dollars a year. Do you make a million? I've never made a million dollars a year. Well, okay, but they own the company because they own that relationship. That's as equally dangerous. So I think you want to make sales agnostic. You want to move people around. You want to change them up. It's kind of like you're a manager of a, of, of a baseball team or a hockey, and you change the lineup. It, that's it's, that's what I find doing. It's is move part of the engineering forcibly into, into sales. They basically oh, threaten with yeah. an yeah. immediate cancellation of their contract. But that's what I try to do. And some people actually were enlightened by this. And I think the ones who, who were willing to do this, they were much better engineers after a year or two. I mean, there was a huge conversion. Yeah, and, and, that, and, and, it's, it, it, and it's an inspiration. We've gotten away from the sales engineer, which I think is a, a shame. Um, because having a, you know, in, in technology, having a technical expertise with the salesperson, they're much more believable. Um, it's yeah. changed. Men are not believable. Women are. Um, just, just statistically, you know, and, and it changes where you are in the world too. So it, you know, it does vary a lot. But it's sales is a revolving door, and I think it's best. I think it's best to manage it that way. And manage by the numbers, but to mix things up. And, and my favorite is going into a, a, a new company, and if you when you run into resistance, the, the engineer, well, I can't sell. Wait a minute. Everybody sells. You know, to most people, say, "Are you married?" If they say yes, well, okay, you closed the biggest deal of your life. You sold. You know, did you ever ask someone to dance? You sold. It's the same thing. So it's it's some, always... some people. Yeah, I mean, some engineers that are very. A lot of people are attracted to engineering because it 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 allows you to kind of have this this autism, this Asperger's syndrome, and to to not be bothered by anyone, right? You in that yeah. logical sphere of the world where everything makes sense, and if it doesn't make sense, then you you ignore it. And sales is very different, right? It's back to humans. It's back to the caveman. It's back to being. Um, involved in things that are more social, that are for a lot of people who have this autistic flair, who are often extremely good engineers, um, it's just something they want to want to avoid. I feel it's not to their benefit because if they would master this social aspect, they would be a better person, more successful and everything in their life. But there's a strong resistance into this. I always run into this. And then you actually lose half of your engineering team if you really push this. And then you're really in trouble because suddenly you don't, you only have half the people left. I mean, hopefully those are the good ones, but sometimes you, you get rid of a lot of good people. So it's very difficult to balance this from my point of view. Yeah. It, it's an individual call and, and that, and you, when you promote people and you expand that, that's a very, that's a part of that. Where do they go? Yeah. How, you know, a lot of them go into product marketing. Um, I, some of my best product marketers I found come out of engineering. The, the latest group that have that problem are the data engineers. Yeah, People the data really science, data. Yeah. They're very good at databases. They don't understand what questions to ask. Yeah. You know, big data is great, but it's useless without analytics. And what kind of analytics? You know, again, you got to know what questions to ask and why. And, you know, should yeah. we, this is a good example of, of data visualization and how that can help because you it helps you to see the data in different ways yeah this human ingenuity will always will always be the deciding factor right some people call it talent i had mike's a it's this human ingenuity to come up with 
a different on a different changing battlefield came up with the with the right questions but also with the right answers and i think this is where we are still needed when the machines take over but i wanted to ask you a quick a uh, different question the, the the values we just talked about um or the difficulties to bring together technology and salespeople how is it different in other countries is it is afghanistan and you know the, the role of religion obviously is for for me very interesting there do you feel um, like a religion, say, say Judaism, who, who now really spawns an unlimited amount of engineers, it seems, every day and investments, is that, is that really a factor um, when you go to Islamic countries or is that so much, you know, concealed from the individual that these values, these big values, right, that, that on, on day-to-day work, they shouldn't matter so much. Do you feel they shine through or that's something where you feel like, well, it's really down to the individual? That's a very interesting question. I find, from my observation, it's do you ask questions of things? And are you encouraged to ask questions about everything? And I'll give you a, a, a different twist on that. One of my favorite organizations to observe or use an example is a company called Dimension Data. Now they are now their software and technology company that originated in South Africa. They're very unique because during apartheid, when they got their start, no one would play, you know, they were cast and no one would play in the sandbox with them. Therefore, they had to invent everything themselves for themselves. And so they developed a very different way of doing things than everybody else. Their software is different, their coding is different, their way of of, um, doing quality checks, everything is very different. And that's that's a very, you know, it's it's very interesting to look at the cultural impact and where you are on the world. Islam has a wonderful, rich history, but it's been stifled since the 8th century. Don't ask questions. Don't, don't, don't push and and that is changing and some of the most entrepreneurial software places certainly for mobile developers has been in islamic countries some of the more um socially relevant things i've seen in islamic countries there's no one else helping them so they're helping themselves and so you look at things like seven villages and and some of the you know there's a whole world out there, as they call for the other five billion, um, that that are off the radar for most, you know, for the Googles and Facebooks. Um, that is a different way of doing things, and so you see technology, uh, most notably in mobile, is very different than say Indonesia or Bangladesh, um, than or or in um, Central Africa than it is in China or the U.S. or Europe. Yeah, there is this this idea, and I, I I've been been putting my head around this of charter cities, right? So you take the best of a city, say Dubai, or the best values of technology development, say agriculture from from Israel, and um, you take a certain piece of technology and you put it into a new framework and a framework that has chosen to be very effective, say Dubai, say Singapore, and you put this city, and you, you for whatever reason you get this grant, you can develop the city say, in the middle of, of the jungle in, in Brazil or in Colombia. And I, was, I, I still feel this would be wonderful. We, there's tons of political issues with this, but let's assume you, you, you get the, the ability to pull this off politically, to just take the best of what, say, the free markets organization, the court, the trust in the, in, in, in a, in a law system, and then you take a bunch of technology and you just bring these two together, a bunch of people, do you think it would take off it's that easy or do you think there is something to it that's say you you work with in a, in a random city in the colombian jungle which has say ten thousand people you bring a bunch of people in do you think you can you would be able to pull this off say this is like a ceo project so to speak or there is more to it like you can't just go into a random place and just kind of fly in this ufo and make this 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 particular city take off no i think you can it, it... Intellectual capacity is equal everywhere in the world. Absolutely, unequivocally equal. What is different is opportunity. 
Now, you could go and take that technology to someplace in Borneo. They will take it, they will see it, but it, the reaction will be different to it than Malaysia or Central Africa. And they will probably see things that you and I did not. They will adapt to it differently. That's not, and that is not, that's not a bad thing. I think that's a very good thing. Because they're going to innovate and come up with different things and they're going to find different relevant values than you or I might. Yeah. So it, it, it's very, once you, if you can make opportunity equal, I think you're going to see very different things. And I, you know, I, I think that's part of, I feel part of the responsibility of big tech is to try and create more opportunity. It's good business to create more opportunity. Well, they're, they're monopolists. So they're in, in their core business, they're obviously not interested in creating opportunity, right? They want it on other layers on top of them or below them. But that's, that's a real problem that they have so ingrained in the infrastructure and they make so much money. There's very little for them to really go out there and create a new business. As you said earlier, if you don't innovate, then you're dying. Um, maybe I said and, that, and, but you, you gave me the inspiration. I, I, right, and I've made a career by going after that and attacking that. Um, yeah. You know, the, the Silicon Silicon Valley is a bunch of idiots. They are the most arrogant. They are the most arrogant group. You now that's a huge stereotype, but as a group, I think it's the most arrogant culture I've ever encountered. Unjustifiably arrogant. Oh, the airline industry is equally worse. Yeah, it, it, I mean, big part of the travel industry are like that. Yeah, I mean, telecom are the biggest bunch of idiots in the I, I wouldn't have a job if they were smart. <laughs> I mean, they're, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're running, you know, 20, the, the train is 20 years behind the times on the tracks. Yeah. How do you feel the, the role of institutions um, really play in this, you know? There's this theory that people say, well, there's these these uh, these, these undergirding layers, it might, might be religion, might be ethics, work ethic, whatever that is. And then you have these, but if you actually want to produce a healthy, competitive, curious um, person in your company with a lot of talent um, that creates, that actually looks for the opportunity, what do you feel the role of institutions is? So institutions, we, we talk about schools, we talk about universities, and we, we, we feel like right now in the US, we've lost a lot of those. Um, there's a lot of change going on. People use the word compromise. People act very ideological instead of you know, use some common sense. And that's absolutely true if you go like to Nigeria, a lot of uh, universities have a very different agenda. They don't care about the students, right? They, they're driven by an agenda that is not really open. It's not displayed to the students or the teachers who send their kids. Do you think these institutions really matter or none of you have the internet, we, we become all um, very libertarian and say, well, we don't have to worry about this. So the market is gonna fix this. I think they are. In hugely impactful. Um, however, it has become distorted. And by distortion, I mean it's re beyond ridiculous that it's $100,000 a year to go to university. And universities are a big business. It, it's shameful. They're not there to educate. One of the, the you know, one of the nice things I, I enjoyed about Huawei is I had a budget you know, not a huge, you know, $20 million a year in corporate responsibility, you know, around the world. And a, a lot of it I did in edu education programs, helping kids in Namibia, you know, learn to code. Now, it's not going to impact my bottom line, but 10 years from now, hopefully it's going to create a, a marketplace where they might buy more of my stuff. And so I think that, you know, but and that's the way these institutions need to be, I, I think, reformed. And, and again, I, I again, I've got some kind of radical ideas. I, I don't. I think teachers should be fired, and you and I should be a teacher. You know, again, that we are required. It. It. We are required to you know provide and give back. You know, four or eight years of our life by doing something. Now, if you could be a teacher for four years. How cool would that be? 
Well, that's my YouTube channel, right? So, yeah. no, I, I, I'm, I'm it, it, we don't need it, teachers. It, it, if we need teachers, we only need one. The same reason we don't need journalists anymore. We can just go to YouTube. The intermediary yeah. role is non-existent anymore. And that's true for professors. Maybe we need one professor of psychology and one for engineering. But literally, we need only one in the whole planet or maybe 10 of them. But it's a relatively small number that produce exceptional good value. And then we just we need to solve um, how we motivate people to actually learn. Because right now you're kind of in this in this gulag. We call it a, a kindergarten and we call it a middle school. We call it elementary school, a middle school and high school. It's kind of a gulag. You, you're forced to go there unless there's huge social pressure coming down the road. And the same is kind of true for universities. We, I think the content we solved already, it's all on YouTube. That's, that's, you know, I'm really thankful for Google for doing this. But the, the other problem is we don't, nobody needs teachers anymore for that respect, but how do we get people, kids or like younger people to actually learn? Or is it again, libertarian and they, they will get interested sooner or later and stuff. I, I, yeah, I think this is where institutions are, can be beneficial in that it's certainly in the United States. I think we need to think of political ethics as a religion. If you, yeah, like, if you, like took, Plato. If you uh -huh. took the Constitution and what it is supposed to be, what the Declaration of Independence says, and treated it like you do a religious document, that you're not going to have people protesting or you're not going to have people taking shots at each other for disagreeing. And I think that is, it is something, in, certainly in the United States, you're getting an individual rather than people, you know, they talk about the greatest generation, you know, World War II, post-depression, but everybody working together, not agreeing, but pulling together in a common way toward common goals. That's the role of institutions to reinforce. And I think that has become lacking. Yeah, I mean, the incentives have gone away. And let's put it this way, there's so many more alternatives, right? You can learn from YouTube. You can build your social network on YouTube. Um, there's, there's so many avenues that the internet provides. So the, the, the real need to do something in the real world, like we talked about that earlier, not just infrastructure, but for the social beings, it's been diminished so much. And I think this is only, I mean, maybe it's going to... It's going to come back, but I feel like there's going to be a whole new host of of incentives that people have to 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 rediscover this learning. And I see this with my own children; what they have incredible skills that I I wasn't even aware of. But a lot of things where I feel they should know what to do, like they, they still have trouble with spelling at a pretty advanced age, um, in, in, in teenagerhood. I'm like, this is crazy. This is ridiculous. But on the other hand, they can do crazy things in uh, graphics. Um, um, graphic design that I'm like I I can I don't even know anyone who can do this by the age of 30, right? So the the, the skill set is going to be very very small in that sense, but very deep. And for that, these schools are useless, right? Because they wanted to make a pretty broad based industrial worker. Don't think too much, just know the facts or some of the facts that you think is the consensus. But now we realize the consensus isn't so stable as we all thought. I mean, consensus about anything, you know, you can question flat Earth, and Maybe it's good for our kids to really just not have a consensus, but just have a very, very deep skill. Obviously, what we see the problem right now is that they can be easily influenced, and then they go in into a direction politically, emotionally, that you're like, whoa, there's no common sense left. But maybe that's how the world works these days. Common sense is really not a monetizable skill anymore. Yeah, I, I, I tend to go the other way. And, and you know, okay. looking at my career, I'm a generalist. Um, I've learned a great deal about an incredible amount of, I know a little bit about a lot of things. Um, yeah. and, and I'm not, you know, either, yeah, I can go fairly deep on some things, but it's always relative. Um, I, I don't think being a specialist or a generalist is a good thing because, you, again, you don't know what questions to ask. That leads to ignorance in too many areas. And, and you know, this, this gets into you know, education um, a, a rigorous education in a specific discipline versus a liberal art education. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I, I'm switching my, my own perspective. I'm obviously a very strong common sense guy, but I also see that this is for, for this generation. It's definitely hard 
because there's so much information out there, right? If we, we grew up and um, when we had a certain body of, of knowledge that was to be taken, there were like, say, a thousand books in the library. And that was all you needed to know, right? And that was kind of the consensus. That's all you needed to know. And you needed to look into everything a little bit. And that was fine. But now it's totally different. I mean, there's like a billion books and nobody knows that these books are completely nonsensical. That like the whole relationship with facts has gone out of the window. Um, but it doesn't mean they're all fake news, right? But there's just so much more information. So for the kids to get this understanding of this is the final, somewhat final defined corpus of knowledge, it's completely gone. This, it, it's, it cannot be managed like this anymore. So I think we need to, to so I swap my perspective from one day where I say, oh my gosh, we, all, we can't have all a, a dance degree and uh, um, Russian literature and expect to make money with this. But on the next day, then I see, oh, if you do the best, best podcast about Dostoevsky, I mean, this thing is going to make you rich, or at least it's going to be so much fun that you're going to be, at least you're going to be happy. If you're really going to make a lot of money, maybe not immediately, but think about Dostoevsky and all these writers, they never really made any money during their lifetimes. And then a hundred years later, they be became famous. Going back, are they, is that for them the best decision to write and then put this to paper like Nietzsche and Dostoevsky? I mean, for them, it must have felt very good to, to just articulate this, right? Even if they never made money from this and if they would have gone into sales, they would have been able to provide much better for their family. If I'm understanding your question, it, it, I, I think there's great benefit. Learning is a lifetime process. We never stop learning and, never, and, and I think that's part of being human. And if you, if you stop that or stagnate, I think that process, I think you get into trouble. Um, and part of, I think there's too much, uh, the influencer ahead, is too, for a second. sorry, the, the influencer is much too important. There's, you know, Kim Kardashian is Kim Kardashian. She didn't mean anything to me. Um, and yeah, okay, she'll have, she'll have an opinion on something, great. I'll take that in. I'll take in a hundred other opinions. Call you a boomer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, and, but you take in all the information and you, you need to sift through it. Um, you know, any historian um, is going to look at what other people have written about something, but they're going to come to their own conclusion. They're going to look for other examples to say, oh, I think these guys may have missed something or they got something wrong. And that's, and that's the art and, and joy that a historian does, of, you know, constantly looking at an event that thousands of other people have looked at previously. But that's, yeah. that's part of being human, is to learn and improve and change. And, and you can't do that if you stop learning and stop asking questions. Well, that's, that's the perfect segue to my next question. You, you, I feel like you're in, you're in a point of your life where you, you definitely have this motivation to give back. Um, where you, you've, ooh, and I've, I've, we've talked about that before. What's kind of your plan? Where do you see yourself personally? And how do you, how do you pull off this giving back? What's kind of your, your, your personal uh, contribution to, to society after a career where you already massively contributed? But w w what's your personal plan for that? Um, I don't have a specific plan. I try and help. Um, I'm helping about half a dozen different businesses right now, just as an unpaid advisor. Um, I love LinkedIn for that aspect. That, and I, and I probably have conversations like this a hundred times a year, and it's it's enjoyable. And I'll give you you know anybody my two cents. I'll try and help them. I want them to be a better marketer than I ever. And, and to learn from my mistakes, and I can tell you where I fell down and skinned my knees, and please don't do that. Yeah. And that's, that's the yeah. best we can, that's it's the best that we can hope for. Sometimes. Go ahead. No, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, no, that, I, I was just saying that's, that's really difficult sometimes to get this message across because um, younger folks, and I, we, I think we were the same, um, the learning from abstract experience, meaning other people's experience and other people's knowledge, it's much harder than learning from concrete experience. It's just how our brain works, right? So getting this across and getting it into the minds of young people is tough, especially now with so much distraction out there. Yeah, and it, it goes back to, a, you know, again, marketing, Casio, go and see. The best 
example of a mobile device was in about 2003. I was in Sweden with another couple. We were having dinner. And there was nobody else in the restaurant. We could not get a waiter. And I mean, 20 minutes, we're looking for the bill. My friend finally pulled out his mobile, called the restaurant. Somebody answered, said, could you please give us our bill? That suddenly opened up for me. Oh my gosh, look at what we can do with this, this mobile device. It can be tied into billing and service and ordering and you could, and now we have a tablet you know, the waiter brings a tablet for you to check out and take your credit card. It, um, but that was, you know, it's that observation. And again, going back to Casio, going and seeing. Every time I went to a new place, I, you know, first thing I would do is get off the plane, go to my hotel, but then I'd go to the mall and I'd look at what people are buying. Why are you buying that? Why are you buying that one? What are you doing? You know, you start, you talk to people. That's, that's the only way to, that's marketing. That's marketing. You can't read a report. If 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 you had, and that's that's very related to this. If you had the chance to go any company you want, or you are an entrepreneur, um, really young yourself right now, um, you're 25 years old. What would you take a second look at? Where do you feel is like a, if you can as specific as you can be, what do you think are great opportunities right now that you say, well, this hasn't really been done, and it's like. It's, it's asking to be solved, and there's money there, uh, just nobody has done it yet. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities around. It, it kind of depends also what you're interested in, where you are. I think there's advantage. You can make arguments for saying going to a, you know, a big place um, where you have the resources. It's hard to get something done in a smaller organization. There's huge opportunities with biometrics, that's going to be absolutely monstrous. Um, medicine, robotics, um, how you use data, and, and data in a permission-based marketing way. I think that's going to be one of the big changes we're going to see. Um, yeah. So, you know, there are, there's a lot of opportunities around. Just, you know, the, the, the digital assistant is going to be absolutely monstrous. And I think there's going to be somebody new. It's not going to be Cortina or Alexa. Somebody's going to come up on a mobile device. And that will be an absolute shift for all those players. And, and, some, and, and one of those guys, you know, Microsoft or Google will, will, or Apple will try and buy whoever comes up with that. Yeah. So that there's a there's a I think mobility is going to have you know mobile developers software eats the world so learning to code and what you can do in code is going to be huge in the next fifteen years. Yeah, so if someone posts on your Twitter feed, learn to code, you you think it's not an insult? No, no. Okay. You you need to learn to code, and then and then the next jump will be you know codeless things and that will create you know that will start to empower you and and you and me and I, I can code very clumsily but, what's you know, your favorite language person, what, are you, what are you coding in no i can i can i can code in you know a, a dozen different languages from from mainframe to writing you know h um php um in, in any number of different languages, but I'm, I'm very slow and kludgy. An engineer will quickly slap my wrist and say, oh, gee, Mr. Bear, wants to let me do that for you. Um, which makes me the perfect, you know, vice president or whatever, because I can spot spaghetti code or when somebody's trying to BS me or tell me it's going to take a thousand man hours to do something. I'm like, well, wait a minute, come on. Um, that That's kind of the advantage. Like I said, I know a little about a number of things. Um, but I think, you know, when we get to codeless, then everybody will be able to come up with their own application and way of doing And then you're going to see innovation in coming from all over the world. That's kind of a, a like I said, the, the intellectual capacity is equally distributed around the world. Once they get that kind of opportunity, you're going to see an explosion.
Yeah. Yeah, I spoke to Daniel, Daniel Gross a couple of um, days ago, and he's running a uh, remote um, accelerator. And he's, he's been um, putting a lot of emphasis on the idea of getting that same potential that's out there, that's in Africa, that doesn't have a lot of access to the same Silicon Valley meetings, and um, getting them into an accelerator and then um, de- helping them develop that piece of technology, monetizing it, uh, making it a business potentially. And um, I thought the idea is really fascinating. Um, I sometimes wonder if it's too much science fiction um, and that's actually a long time away. I, I've been to many places in Africa, for instance, and the, the, the participation in technology and the technology is there, right? There's internet everywhere. It's not difficult to access, but the, the actual participation in technology is, is extremely low. Like in a, in a way, I mean, there's obviously there's always examples where it's different, say payment systems, and it's it's not universally low. But if if you think now we have access to the same library of Alexandria, everyone can access the same internet. Let's assume it's very fast, and, and even in Africa, it's a lot of places with really fast internet. You would expect that people will just migrate to knowledge based jobs immediately, and this is happening every day. I'm just the speed is much slower than I would expect. It's not, say, 10 years and then everyone works in, in an internet-based, knowledge-based economy. It's maybe 50 years. I mean, it's, it's or maybe it's 100 years. It's surprisingly slow. I find this strange when I, when I go, I mean, Kenya is under the leading edge in Africa, but even in Ghana, which is super, super fast, internet, fiber in many places, there is a lot of uptake. Well, yeah, but you have other problems. You're, again, Who wants whatever you're doing? Why? Who wants to sell it? Why? One of the biggest problems in Africa is distribution. How do you distribute something? How do you service something? That's, those are huge challenges. Now you could be a musician and distribute your music. And that's very, that's a, that's something you can do, but there's only so many, not everybody can become a musician and and generate music and make a living from it. Um, yeah. And only so many, so many people are talented in music. But yeah, but you could you could write an AI that gets I don't know gets all the legal documents that are available, just parses them, comes up with the proper document, and sells it for a couple of cents. So I mean, obviously, distribution must be in the cloud, right? I mean, that's the the, the whole physical infrastructure is is not useful in in, in Africa, and probably never will. Um, but you can leapfrog in and just do all of these layers online. I mean, the same way you learn, you can distribute stuff, right? And it, well, maybe not everyone can be a musician, but everyone can build an AI and do something useful. No, but the world is, is does not exist online. The world is still a physical world. You're right, but obviously you gotta you gotta focus on that cloud aspect, right? If you don't focus on the cloud, then you just can't do it. I mean, then then I mean, I don't even know how you wanna wanna pull this off. But the cloud has nothing to do with someone who likes to paint pictures. The cloud has nothing to do with someone who likes to build a house or build you can a sell boat. pictures online, or you, I mean, there's Etsy. Obviously, yeah, you need a platform. Yeah, right? that is a problem. Or maybe you just have to build the platform. But yeah, right. And that's, that is the problem. And, and so Western Facebook wants to come into Africa. Well, I don't think that's the solution. I think there needs to be a, someone in Africa needs to come up with something that's relevant for Ghana and Africa and then the African diaspora. And, you, you know, you've got different physical boundaries. You've got Northern Africa, you've got Sub-Sahara, and you've got Southern Africa. You've got French speaking and English speaking. You've got a lot of cultural barriers across that continent. So, you know, you're not, you're, you're very hard to do one thing that's going to be universally accepted and translate um, across the entire continent. Yeah, no, that's for sure. That's really difficult and it's very, very hard to pull that off. And, but well, what I was trying to say is if given that amount of opportunity people have already, and, and it, that's with them for the last 20 years, right? I mean, the internet itself is still a little relatively new, but it is, has been around for at least two decades and internet availability has also been around in many countries for at least 15 years. Yeah, I, well, I was expecting, and this is my too optimistic worldview, I was expecting everyone is suddenly migrating. Like, I mean, that's the second it's available, you just listen to the MIT courses and you become an MBA just, just remotely. But it doesn't happen that way, obviously, and you're probably much wiser there. 
it goes a much slower cycle. And, it, you know, people grow up with this and then they might choose to follow that path and others go become a lawyer and have nothing to do with technology. Right. Um, it, so it's, it, 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 takes a, it takes a lifetime to really get this into your head. Let's put it this it, way. It takes a generation at least for adoption. So you got 20 yeah. years and, and you're going to have some that accept and some that see it in a different way. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, but they're going to do, they're going to perceive, look at something and see it differently than you and I might. They're going to see a different value in it and they're going to see a different tangent that it could be used for. And that takes, that takes time to sort out. Yeah. What's your, your personal gut feeling? And now with COVID, we see this much quicker adoption of technology. And a lot of people say, oh, we had this last 20 years, the, the, the new generation that had to grow in, we didn't see the uptick of technology that we've seen before, at least when we compare it to certain graphs in, in, um, in GDP growth and, and productivity growth. Do you feel COVID was going to fix all this for all the negativity that people have about COVID that we have right now because it killed so much of the real economy? Do you think we, we are out of this and everyone is now going to adopt this technology or going to be more productive and it's going to be a roaring 20s or are you on the other side of this? No, nah, no. Nah. Other, other side. Way on the other side. It, it okay. is a, um, it's a wake-up call. Um, I think yeah, COVID is, is un very unpleasant, but it's, it's here to stay. It's, it's, you know, it's the new cold. It's the new you know, flu. And it, as, a, as a herd, we will adapt. It'll kill off people. Um, but then as a group, human beings will deal with it much better. It'll become you know, another flu or another common cold. Um, some things will go back. Some technologies will have greater adoption. Others need a lot more refinement. And, and that's what I'm more disappointed in is that there, there has been very little in terms of, you know, remote work. Um, I, I call it interaction mapping. If you think about um, the customer journey map, a, a business can look at, especially in the digital world, how do you find me and what I'm doing? And we look at every decision gate you have in that process. Those are known as actionable moments of truth. Well, all that technology exists, but we don't look the other way. We don't look internally in the company. We don't look through the, from you to you're buying something through the distribution, then through the, the business itself and all the, the departments and, and organizations. And that this really helps, you know, who talks to who, why, how much, how often, in, and in what way. And then even out to supply chain. Well, you can look at that entire ecosystem and quantify it. Where are we more efficient? Where could we be more efficient? The vice president of whatever says no 67.2% of the time. Everything we know about the marketing to the end user, we could use internally to make ourselves more efficient and therefore a lot more profitable. And that so you're saying... Am I understanding you right? Did you did you want a way that consumers can talk to us and tell us what they want as an innovation? Yeah, well, that's that's part of it. That's part of it, and okay. that that improves yeah. that. But it's the same. All the stuff that we know about talking to the consumer, we could use all that internal. And when you're talking okay. about distributed workforces, people working at home, we're not. Nobody, you know, we've got the technology, but nobody's putting the pieces together to connect the dots and make that happen. And I think... Well, I don't, know, I don't know. One idea that comes to mind immediately is that there's a lot of these internal Slack channels or like just chat yeah, channels within... Yeah, that's an example, like. but Slack doesn't have analytics to it. Slack does not connect to the configuration management database to who accesses the ERP application and how much. And what databases are they looking at? That's yeah. and the technology is there. We're not doing that. Yeah. Well. So what? What? What I think what you what you're getting at would be really interesting is kind of a back channel where we take consumer interaction, like uh, literally reviews, right? That you like Yelp reviews or hotel reviews or technology reviews or what's going on on Slack or anything else in social media, 
And running this through an AI that kind of tells us, okay, those are those are just the disgruntled consumers uh, there. And then those are the ones who, who I don't know, we gave a sudden too good a deal, but here's the top 15 innovations how we could make this thing better. Why don't you make up your mind if we should introduce those? I mean, that would be a great AI, right? If we just run it on any kind of yeah. information and it tells you, okay, think about these 15 things, can you deliver? For, well, all right, I take offense to the expression AI because AI does not exist, period. <laughs> Nowhere okay. in the world does not exist. Well, what, and before what, what you can do, you do AI, you, now you can do that. You can you you start with machine learning, and then you advance to adaptive learning, and eventually you get to the first of three stages of artificial intelligence. We're not even we're bare, we're taking baby steps. So AI is a is a great marketing term. Um, looks nice, but it does not exist. Chatbots are a great example. People, you know, AI powered chat. I built chatbots. I started. I launched them in twenty twelve. They don't exist. It's manual. It's um, machine learning, and then it's manually filling in the code for the holes. That's not artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence teaches itself when it gets a mistake. You know, we've got some laboratory things that are starting to get into the first stages, but it really isn't there. So. I, I take a bit of umbrage at, at using, you know, just because I hate marketers running out there using it as a, a an answer to stuff. But you, yeah, you need to learn how to do capture those in analytics and do machine learning on it, and it can start to give you some predictive analytics, and that can start to tell you what directions to head. Yeah, AI is certainly a buzzword, and it's 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 uh, difficult to nail down what it can do. Um, and there's there's a lot of things that have come out of science fiction that people associate with that. But um, in essence, it's a statistical tool right now. But nevertheless, there's a, there's a huge advances in it the last ten years that nobody would have predicted ten years ago because it's been a technology that never delivered for thirty years or forty years, and it's it suddenly took off and. Maybe that's because I always think it's because Google makes so much money from it. They've been putting hundreds of people on it, the smartest people on the planet. And uh, Eric Weinstein was making this argument. He was he said there is there's all these these theoretical physicists, all these the, the people who do basic research, but they haven't really gotten anywhere in the last forty years, right? There's an immense amount of of incredibly wonderful, highly intelligent people that are stuck in this physics game that kind of didn't deliver. Maybe it will deliver tomorrow, but let's assume the last 40 years. But what if we deploy the same kind of technology into something else, kind of what Google did with AI? Or what, what if we deploy these brains funded by, by uh, public grants into other areas where we feel we could really solve? Driving cars is a bit big to topic right now. Do you think the government at all can can make these decisions and then things will just, uh, like that's the, the argument that Maria Mazzucato makes all the time, is that the government in the end invents the real things and then there's just marketers coming in and, pro and, and monetizing it um, and companies in Silicon Valley. If, if, if you, you believe in socialism, them. if you believe in socialism, yes. If you believe in capitalism, no. Government should yeah, stay out socialism, of that. Well, do you think this is, this is something we can we can do to improve the world is kind of direct basic research kind of be this big central planner be be the singapore um or do you think it has to come from the market like the, all the real innovations are in the end market driven no and quite a few of innovations come out of government and, and like darpa um and i've met a number of those guys and they're really interesting really smart guys and there's a lot of you know universities that are doing government funded doing pure research um, but at the point where it becomes a marketable idea then it needs to go over to the private sector and, and you see a lot of universities that take it they they make the patents and then they license out and they're and they're making revenue off of the patents and that's and that's fine that that's fine um the you know the other the biggest thing I learned at tech, you know, starting at Casio was how do you work around the patents? You know, yeah. th there's, a, there's an antenna in a mobile phone. Nortel at the time had a patent on 
the, the antenna in the mobile phone. Well, we had to find a way to do the same thing, but that did not violate the patent, or else we'd have to pay a fee to Norton. And that is so much of tech is, is spent in how do we work around stuff. So, you know, I, I think government can set out, we're going to send someone to the moon. Great idea. And that fostered, ooh, we're going to have a pen that can write upside down in space. But equally innovative was the Russians who said, oh, I'm going to use a pencil. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the market helps determine what value something has. Yeah, one idea that, that has been floated, and I kind of like it, though I don't, don't have enough insight to actually understand it fully, is why don't we just print a trillion dollars? Like, we're printing so much money anyways right now. Let's just add another trillion. But use this one trillion and take a selection of the, um, who, um, I don't know who would select that, but let's assume we find someone who is smart enough to do that. Let's select all the patents that we want to buy, buy a trillion dollars worth of patents and make them freely available to any entrepreneur um, out there they can develop based on this patent, on that knowledge that's in these patents, they, this kind of becomes a generic, right? So anything that, that was on the patent protection because the government buys it out, we suddenly have this, we democratize this, this innovation, but also the, we democratize away this protection. So we could restart this Cambrian explosion of technology, um, kind of what the internet did, right? Because it was, most of it was freely available. There weren't a lot of patents for protecting a lot of stuff in the beginning because it was government property back in the 60s. Do you think that's worth thinking about it or that's like the wrong way to go at this? I think that's the wrong way to go. It, it's, okay. You're not going to get much out of that. And, and then you run into the whole, yeah, okay, who's going to determine that? What is their criteria? And, you know, I'm putting money into the system. I don't want you using my money for that. So it, it's, What's taxpayer money, right? Or it's, or it's basically what we do with the Fed. We basically, we inflate our currency and a lot of foreign yeah, countries. I, I mean, I, we pay I, for it, but Chinese pay for that too. That's how we can make them pay for COVID, so to speak, because we just yeah. inflate the value of the dollars. The, the, money, the, value, the, but the money has to be repaid at some point. And I, I think that that is a very, very, very slippery slope. Um, it is, but I think we're already we're ninety percent there, right? That's kind of every president comes up with more trillions to print. I think I don't know who the next president will be, but it's going to be more money printing than now. I feel it, it's there. There will come a day to pay the piper, and you know it, the the opposite is, you know, the government is is for example licensing wireless spectrum. It just made another was it fifty billion off of li licensing some of the spectrum, which would be for, you know, later use of 5G and more likely 6G. And, and you know, it, it, it constantly does this because the, pub, the, air, the air is, a, is a, a public right of way. And therefore, that's why the federal communication, um, you know, radio stations can operate for, for free. However, to have a license in a given specific frequency, you have to pay a license for it. And, you know, so the government's trying to take money in. I, I don't see how that's going to be a, a money winner. And I don't see how you could manage that. It, it just seems like yeah. that would be fraught with all kinds of, it's kind of like the, the, the COVID giveaway, um, you know, going yeah, like to- Like TPP loans. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, it, as, as investigative journalists get into that, that's going to stink the high end. And, and oh, I think yeah. That, I mean, this what we are talking about 20, 30 years out. I mean, um, that's already true for PPP loans and airline loans and all these things in my mind. I don't know if we should do them. But now that we are into this idea of just um, accumulating debt like crazy, maybe this is a good way, that the most useful way if you have to go down this route, let's put it this way. Yeah, I, I think there are much better ways that, that you could use the money. And, and rather than, you know, most patents, um, First off, you got to get somebody who's going to sell it. And then, you know, it's kind of like when I wanted to put up a tower in Afghanistan. And I come to you and say, hey, can I put a tower on your building? I'll, I'll give you $100. 
and you go to your neighbor and say, hey, you know, there's Bennett guys giving out money to put a tower up there. And I come to you, you know, the next guy and say, hey, I'd like to put a tower. I say, okay, I, I want uh, $500. And then it's 1000 And by the end of the time, it was getting to be a million dollars to put up a stupid antenna on somebody's building. You know, the, the, it, it doesn't, doesn't work very well. Yeah. So capitalism is broken. That's what you're saying. Well, yeah. And, and it's a system that you, is, is too unable to control. And I think those controls make that fraught with you, you've just wasted a trillion dollars. Yeah. And, who, and what's the expertise of the people who want to take this um, and do something with it? And then what, so basis, thing, right? what basis, yeah, yeah, what basis and, and criteria? Yeah, yeah. and why, well, you and not, why not you and not him? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can make that argument very well to say why, if that patent is so valuable that the public needs access, why didn't someone come around and, you know, create value out of this? Because the public Correct. is able to give anyone they want money. Uh, it's kind of like climate change and uh, lots of those big public ideas. If they're so important to people, and you could say, well, people are small-minded, they don't realize that, but eventually they will become very, very important. Why don't they create and donate to it? I mean, they do, but why isn't that the money that we primarily use for it? So it's kind of a similar discussion. Um, it's kind of, the, the question is how many of those, how, how do we want this knowledge to be out there? And that's, you, you can go into copyrights. I was listening to that yesterday. And, and, it's a similar, very where, similar problem. This is where the market, the, the, the dynamics of the market determine success. And this is the advantage of capitalism. Great example. Edison invented the phonograph. He thought its value was recording an end of life statement for posterity and your family. It was 20 years later when he finally admitted the best use of it was the playback of recorded music. The other application he thought was for business use, recording ideas and thoughts. He never saw using it as a record to record and play back music. You know, it, 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 and it took 20 years for that to happen. That's the problem with a lot of ideas and patents. They take too long to see a return. Yeah, maybe they were a good idea, but most patents are not. The vast majority of them, like entrepreneurs, the vast majority of them go out of business in the first five years. Either they didn't know what they were doing, it was a bad idea, the, the market window passed and somebody usurped their idea. You know, most businesses fail. You know, for every Google, there's easily a hundred failures. And I think I the can, number is bigger, yeah. I can, I can list you 50 search engines that failed that were a better search engine than Google. I, I, I used don't to, wanna, sorry? We don't want to talk about the Stone Age in, in this podcast. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Of course. Oh, yeah, no, 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 let's get into semantic search. That's way beyond anything, you know, that's, that's not here yet. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I used to give talks of why Google doesn't know anything about search, because I work for one of these search engine companies. Because um, yes. there's, you know, there's, there's, you know, Google is Boolean word terms. Most people don't even understand what that is, much less you know, um, uh, folksonomies, taxonomies, building taxonomies on the, on the fly and, and semantic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, it, it's very hard to predict what is the next value of, of innovation. Even if you can make it happen, it's very difficult how the uptake will look like. And that we, I made this example in the last podcast. We, a lot of people now think of, of ByteDance and TikTok, uh, the company behind TikTok, as this revolutionary way to present content and match new content, not content from your followers, but new content. But it's something that Facebook has been doing since day one and or tried doing. It's something that Amazon did back in 2000 with their collaborative filtering. So the basic technology, the, the collaborative filtering um, algorithms have been around for 20 years. Netflix has been doing sure. this since day one to make recommendations. But people think and feel TikTok is this big deal. 
and it is a big deal, a big deal because it's taken off, and that's that's really that's really interesting. But the core technology has been around forever, and it kind of works. It kind of doesn't, depending on how much data you have access to, and that's how good you have to be, right? If you, if you recommend a video that's not that great, people just scroll through. But if you talk about cancer patients and uh, it, you talk about surgery, then you can't you can't be wrong, right? You can be a little bit wrong, but generally you have to be right. But with videos, it doesn't matter. So the the technology has been around for a long time, but it, it takes many iterations until it takes off. And that's the hard part for, for me as an entrepreneur to predict, right? You can take a good piece of technology, you can build something on top of this, but it doesn't mean it goes anywhere. And then the next thing, as you said, you, you don't even have this usage in mind and people just come up with this like PayPal, right? People never thought uh, the, the founders of PayPal that would be used by eBay buyers and sellers. It was never something they intended. It was something that came out of the community and then right. it would be went ballistic with this. So they use this as a way then to, to leverage their own piece of technology. And I'm not sure if there's a, there's a good way to predict this or a better way. It seems very happenstance. And that's what I said to Daniel. He, he said, you know, literally entrepreneurship is an algorithm. I, I, I'm going to build an algorithm and then tell everyone how entrepreneurship works. And I thought that's, that's cool. There's a lot of learnings in this. But on the other hand, there's a lot of luck. There's a lot of ingenuity. There's a lot of gut feeling. And unfortunately, neither AI or any other algorithm can actually represent this right now. Maybe it will in 50 years, but that's difficult right now. No, I, and, and, and I don't think so because, you know, again, I've made my, my entire career on – it's kind of like the um, Peter Drucker business school, which is, you know, you want to shoot for where the puck is going. You follow the trends. Well, if any, sh any schmuck who understands that can do that, then everybody understands where it's going. The trick is to think two or three or four steps ahead of that or the consequence yeah. of that or what's adjacent to that. That's, that's where the magic lies. And that is something that a computer cannot figure out at this juncture. That's, that's yeah. very human. And, and that's, again, if you've got somebody in Madagascar looking at something they're going to see it differently than you or I would. That's where those tangents come from. Yeah. And if you, yeah, it's, it's, so empowering those and then being able to monetize the results of that, that would be a very good business. All right. We should, we should pull that on YouTube. That's, that's the YouTube model to me. Um, <laughs> Anyways, Bennett, that was a fantastic discussion. Thanks for doing this. Uh, thanks for, for, for all these good arguments. I really enjoyed it. Likewise. Thank you. You have to do it again sometime. That will be fantastic. Thanks for your time. All right. Cheers.